Hi, I'm Ken Steele. Welcome back to Season 3 of 10 with Ken. This webcast and my consulting company, Edgevation, explore innovation in higher education. Not innovation in the narrowest sense of research commercialization, but emerging trends and bright ideas across the whole spectrum. Unexpected collaborations, alternate revenue streams, new student services, internationalization, campus architecture, micro-credentials, technology in the classroom, and so much more. When I present at conferences or on campuses, I'm now drawing from a master deck of almost 7,000 slides. It can be overwhelming, I have to admit. But this fall, I made a concerted effort to map 20 years worth of my observations, all 7,000 slides, and synthesize them into one slide to rule them all. A single comprehensive spectrum of higher ed trends and innovations. Although most of my slides take 40 seconds to explain, this one will take the next two episodes. This week, we start with the nine forces for change in higher education. Let's say 10 and take the 30,000 foot view. 10 with Ken is an almost weekly look at higher ed news, trends, innovations, and bright ideas in and out of the classroom. Brought to you by Eduvation. I know some academics insist that innovation is a dirty word. I get it. They blame overeager administrators for forcing change, implementing new budget models and policies, demanding more attention to student success and community engagement, and worst of all, for trimming faculty compliments or completely eliminating programs. But colleges and universities are surrounded on all sides by real pressures to adapt and evolve. Senior administrators, presidents, vice presidents, and deans are acutely aware of these external forces. And I think most are genuinely doing the best they can to adapt in order to preserve as much of the academic tradition as they can. We'll look at the full spectrum of institutional responses, the educational innovations themselves, next episode. From what I've seen working with hundreds of institutions around the world, the pressures for change fall into nine categories. First off, politics is a key driver of change, especially in publicly funded colleges and universities. Political leaders create new campuses or promote colleges to university status in order to win votes. Sometimes they steer research funding towards government priorities or push for knowledge mobilization and economic spin-offs. Politicians demand increased access to higher education, even while capping tuition fees or attempting to legislate cost-saving measures on tenure, MOOCs, or OER textbooks. In the Middle Ages, academies of scholars built walled campuses to protect the ivory tower from the barbarians at the gates. That's no longer an option, and it's not desirable either. <laughs> but small wonder many academics feel under siege from the forces of populism and economic utilitarianism. Even more than politics, though, funding cuts are driving change, often not for the better. Many institutions with defined benefit pension plans have significant unfunded pension liabilities on their balance sheets. There's been steady growth in deferred maintenance of buildings, totaling billions across North America. Government grants have steadily declined for decades on a per-student basis, and in most jurisdictions, colleges and universities are now primarily funded through tuition and other sources. Funding is increasingly being tied to key performance metrics, like student completion, research rankings, or even graduate employment rates or starting salaries. New Zealand's Tertiary Education Commission has started using a contestability of provision approach effectively putting existing programs out to tender to find the best value. Yet, even as government funding has declined, outspoken lawmakers have demanded more and more accountability and reporting, and attempted to steer institutional priorities, often away from the liberal arts and sciences and towards more economic and utilitarian ends. The trend's not new. Almost 50 years ago, U.S. President Ronald Reagan said that the state should not subsidize intellectual curiosity. In a similar vein, the Danish education minister recently declared that Denmark is not going to educate for unemployment. Here in Canada, BC's former premier claimed that degrees that do not lead to employment are a significant human loss. The barbarians are still at the gates. Of course, the U.S. has never seen such an anti-intellectual executive branch. I love the poorly educated. Pressure on funding will only increase in the future. Higher ed expenses continue to rise faster than the rest of the economy. An even bigger pressure than politics or funding is demographics. It has been and will continue to be one of the biggest pressures on higher ed this century. 
Across much of the developed world, fertility rates have been in steady decline for half a century. Immigration is providing more and more of the traditional age student cohort, and is concentrated in major metropolitan areas. Pretty much everywhere else, colleges and universities are struggling with enrollment declines. I wrote about the inevitability of peak campus five years ago, when many institutions were still in deep denial. With fewer traditional students, historically underrepresented groups are arriving on campus in greater numbers. Visible minorities, international students, those with cognitive disabilities, single parents, commuter students, online students. They arrive on campus academically and personally less prepared, and require greater supports and services in order to succeed. The compound effect of these political, financial, and demographic pressures is that higher ed institutions are starting to pay closer attention to the changing needs and expectations of traditional age students. Generations X and Y are sometimes called digital natives. I don't think we're there yet, but they are coming. Certainly today's students are bringing more mobile devices to campus than ever. Varsity Athletics now includes video game teams. In recent years, several colleges and universities have joked about traffic management solutions for students who won't look up from their smartphones while crossing campus. But the real digital natives are still coming. They're the toddlers, currently being toilet trained on the iPoddy. From birth, their skills acquisition will have involved internet connectivity and full-color graphics. They will have higher expectations for 24-7 digital services, integration of augmented and virtual reality in the classroom, and zero-cost open electronic textbooks. Technology in and of itself doesn't drive change in the academy, but demands for budgetary efficiency and competition for students and staff does. Students are also becoming more social, and I don't just mean on social media. There's growing evidence that students are social learners, too. A survey of high school students last year found that 80% preferred to study with friends, and that half of those would do so online if necessary. Classroom pedagogy and campus architecture are being impacted by the increasingly social learning styles of today's students. As a natural introvert, I would love to think that this is a pendulum that may someday swing back, but so far there's no sign of this trend slowing down. Students are becoming more digital and social, but even more significantly, they're getting more and more anxious. That may not be the perfect word for it. I welcome suggestions for a better one. This growing anxiety is driving all sorts of change. Whether you blame student diversity, helicopter parents, grade inflation, or high-stakes testing, counseling center directors report rising levels of anxiety and depression on every campus. Mental health initiatives are proliferating, from stress management and suicide prevention to trigger warnings and sexual consent campaigns. Controversial speakers and professors are being suppressed. Needs and expectations for student services are rising, and lawsuits result when those expectations aren't met. But most of all, students are anxious about their career prospects. And who can blame them? Youth unemployment is high. Jobs are precarious. Automation and AI promise a fourth industrial revolution that may eliminate millions of jobs. With rising tuition fees, students and families are focusing on short-term return on investment. Humanities enrollments are sliding, just when you could argue we need them most. Students fantasize about being in high demand when they graduate, as depicted in this spot, from Malardalen University College in Sweden. If you're keeping count, that's seven forces for change so far, but there are two more that we shouldn't ignore. Industry and employers have always been important influences on program design at colleges and technical institutes, but increasingly careerist students and government emphasis on graduate employment rates has universities paying closer attention to the labor market as well. I hate to tell you, but in this environment, employers, not academics, are the arbiters of academic quality. Employers are demanding graduates with workplace-ready skills, offering work placements, developing custom training programs and badging systems, and increasingly partnering with colleges and universities in unprecedented ways. Finally, last and also sadly least, higher education is evolving in response to the findings of science. Sure, academics love revolutionary discoveries that break paradigms in their field, but somehow few greet changes to their employment circumstances with the same enthusiasm. Academic culture has been extraordinarily resistant to change, despite plenty of research evidence that might point the way. Teaching practices have remained unchanged for the better part of a millennium, 
The majority of contact time is still spent in lecture. Though I've argued in a previous episode we should really reconsider our dependence on a thousand-year-old model based on church sermons. The academic calendar is an agrarian one, from the days when students were needed in the fields. Essays, exams, scholarly monographs, and academic journals are antiquated models that nonetheless go largely unchallenged. Most disciplines and the structure of degrees were established in the 19th century. But to some extent, new research findings in cognitive psychology, neuroscience, and the scholarship of teaching and learning are gradually informing pedagogy in higher education. MOOCs and personalized adaptive learning platforms are providing an opportunity to experiment at scale and generating big data on student learning. It's far from the strongest pressure for change in higher ed, but in a perfect world it would be. So that's a quick overview of the nine key forces that are simultaneously exerting increasing pressure on colleges and universities in the 21st century. Some may be cyclical, like politics, which can swing wildly from one end of the spectrum to the other. Perhaps student interest in liberal studies will someday swing back too. But many of these pressures have been steadily growing for half a century or more and show no sign of changing course. Governments face rising debt and aging populations that will require more investment in healthcare for seniors than education for youth. The world's population is increasingly concentrated in major urban centers, not necessarily where previous generations established beautiful pastoral campuses. And whatever you might think of Twitter or YouTube, Every successive generation has been progressively more comfortable researching, creating, and collaborating in a digital space. When I present on these converging trends, a perfect storm for higher ed, people sometimes accuse me of being a prophet of doom. Not at all! My real focus is the remarkable breadth of innovations that will allow colleges and universities to survive and thrive in the years ahead. I work with institutions to brainstorm strategies, improve recruitment marketing, and address enrollment challenges. Those innovations have been the focus of dozens of past episodes, and will be the subject of many more in the future. Thanks again for taking 10 with me. Now that we've summed up the trends impacting higher ed, we can turn our attention to the many ways in which institutions are responding. Join me next time when we survey the whole spectrum of higher ed innovation at a glance. To be sure you don't miss it, take a moment now to join more than 15,000 10 with Ken subscribers and followers on any of a dozen platforms. You'll find links to all these channels and an email subscription form on our website at 10withken.com. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you next time. 10 with Ken is a production of Eduvation Inc. Copyright 2017. I'm available for conference keynotes, campus PD events, board retreats, and committee workshops, in person or now virtually, too. For more information, please visit www.eduvation.guru or 10withken.com.